Good afternoon guys, uh, welcome to our three o'clock animal encounters. Um, it's going to be myself, Ben, I'm going to chat to you about our little guy here, who is Crusher, our royal python, and with Sophie behind the camera. Hello. So, uh, we're going to wait to sort of get around 12 people to join us, and then we are going to begin. Uh, so, please feel free to um, do the video sharing feature on the Facebook video. Uh, please feel free to comment, like, uh, react, and um, please uh, let us know if you have any questions whatsoever, and I will do my best to answer them. We are aware that there is a slight delay on the questions being written and then getting to us, um, so please excuse me if I go and check my phone to make sure there are none we're missing on the video. So, uh, got 12 we so far. We've got 12. Excellent. So, um, to people who've just joined, a very, very good afternoon to you. Uh, this here is Crusher. Crusher is a royal python. Some of you may have seen him earlier on. Um, I think it's probably earlier on this month. Um, out with Katrina. Um, we've brought him back out for you guys to see. He is our, one of our favourite snakes. We've got four snakes here at Notcatch. Uh, and he's probably our most reliable. He is the we call him our bomb proof snake because he is the one that will quite happily be handled by just about anyone. Um, he's been with us here, uh, well he's, he's my own snake so he's been coming here for 10 years, he's about 12 and a half years old um, and in those 10 years he's been handled every day. So uh, he's very very used to coming out and seeing all of you guys. Um, now obviously you're not here at the moment uh, and we often get asked do the animals mind not seeing you? Do, do we think they miss you? Um, the answer is uh, it's very species dependent um, it really depends on the species. For the snake, absolutely not. Um, I would definitely argue that the snake really couldn't care less. Um, they don't have the cognitive function to really feel, uh, to really feel a sort of emotion, to really understand uh, the sort of feeling of loss of you having not having you here. Being handled for him is just a different sensation. It's quite enriching. It's quite stimulating. Um, particularly if you take him to places where he hasn't been before, uh, take him to an environment that's far more enriching with a far more stimuli in the area. But that is basically what he's doing. He's just reacting to stimuli. He doesn't feel affection for us, doesn't see us as a friend or a loved one. We are just literally there with, with stimulus for him. Um, so they are amazing snakes. They are royal pythons, as I've said, arguably one of the most commonly kept in captivity, um, probably second only to the corn snake. Um, they are ex um, exceptionally popular as pets, and that's mainly due to their temperament. Um, so I said that he's one of our bomb-proof snakes. He's one of those snakes that we can pretty much get out for everyone and feel confident that he's going to be okay with them. That is due to a, a tremendous amount of handling, but also due to his species. The royal python in general is a fairly lethargic, fairly laid-back snake. Um, and that goes sort of back to his hunting instincts, the way that these guys actively, uh, the way that these guys hunt in the wild. Um, you've got a lot of different types of snake, that goes without saying, but the two main sort of forms of hunting with your snakes are your active hunters and your uh, ambush or passive hunters. So, someone like a corn snake, um, some of you might have seen Fred our rat snake or Jules our corn snake in past videos, um, they are active hunters, they actively go in search of their food. Um, so there are a lot, um, they move around an awful lot more, um, they're definitely more of a handful when it comes to handling them, but they actively go out and search for their food. Royal pythons, and a lot of your vipers as well, they are um, passive hunters, they're ambush hunters. What they will do is they will find the perfect spot um, to lay in ambush, to lay in wait for their prey to arrive. Um, so commonly that will be near scent trails, uh, that will be near trails uh, for small rodents. Um, so they are inactive for large portions of the day. Um, that's why they're such good animals to handle, because they're not quite as quick or as much of a handful as your colourbreds, as your sort of rat snakes and corn snakes. Um, and one of their defence mechanisms in the wild, which we will cover later on, is their tendency to basically just roll into a ball if they feel under threat. Have we got any questions so far? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, Joanne would like to know, well, Eric, sorry, would like to know if he has ever bitten you. Uh, that's a good question. Have you ever bitten me? No, no. Uh, in the 12 years I've had him, he's never bitten me. Um, I'll be honest, I've worked with royal pythons, I've sort of 
uh, at this collection and others for yeah about 12 13 years and then in that time I've been bitten by two that's it um, they are really really docile snakes and both those times I will say it was my fault uh, I was trying to feed him with my fingers which is just just thick like just, just it, totally my fault um, I'm gonna come down onto this level so we can have a little go in the grass um, we'll put on this nice bit of grass here um, it was totally my fault they're very very docile snakes most of the time most of your smaller species particularly your pythons they are going to try and get away as we've said in previous videos um, most animals are going to try and escape rather than fight when you fight and you enter conflict you increase your risk of being injured an awful lot more if you run for it you're much more likely to escape uh, without having to enter conflict and to be honest we're not worth the energy he can't eat me he knows i'm not going to eat him so there really is no point in um trying any other questions none so far excellent so so these guys are found in western and central africa in open forest and savannah um but they're quite a dive they're quite a rugged animal they're quite sort of fairly sort of tough rugged animals they can uh, battle the weathers quite well obviously incredible highs in regards to temperature um, some real dramatic lows as well um, that they have to deal with particularly at night um, they also have to deal with what are quite inclement what is quite inclement weather they have to deal with um, obviously their rainy season which is quite minor um, in places but can be quite severe at times they have to deal with bushfires it's actually one of the leading causes for these guys to die um, in sort of bushfires and grass fires um, that really does affect them any other questions fantastic so I'll chat to you a little bit about his hunting strategy so as I say he's an ambush hunter so he's gonna sit there and he's gonna wait for his prey to come to him but he has to work out where to sit because some areas for laying an ambush are going to be um, more productive than others um, so what he's going to do is he's going to need to try and find an area where there, which is a natural highway for prey. Now there is a bit of debate as to how he does that. How does he find his food? Well, um, it was commonly thought, and still is, that these guys are mainly scent hunters. So they mainly use that uh, fantastic sense of smell, which is snake is kind of renowned for. They've got a Jacobson's organ in the roof of the mouth, flick that tongue out, pick up scent particles. That gives them an idea on the location, gives them an idea on the type of prey that is around. Um, but what makes these guys quite special, and if I can get you to zoom in, Sophie, uh, yeah. on the side of his head, what's that? If he wants, no, yeah, it's fine. Um, like, as in, I'm trying to... These little red... <laughs> I can't. Hold on. Oh, sorry. What's that? That's fine. These little red dots on the side of his upper jaw are heat pits, um, help him pick up the sort of thermal signatures of his prey. And um, what we also read there, uh, another thing that has been uh, recently suggested is they are actually quite sight based. Um, it has been suggested that they um, are able to follow traces of UV. Now, why would being able to see in UV help, uh, be helpful? Well, rodents, they are constantly urinating. Urinate, uh, urine shows up well under UV light. So much like kestrels, much like a lot, uh, some of your birds of prey, um, they can see in UV, they can follow that urine. Um, either to a nest or for in crusher's case most likely to find an area where there's a high propensity of uh, maybe urine of um sort of traffic going to and from and he can sit there he's not going to do it um because he's an animal and as soon as you say or do something he's not going to do it but usually he'll sit there curled up waiting for that prey to come along the prey comes past he'll bite it very very quickly they've got rapid striking they'll rapidly bite out grab the prey on the head or the neck normally if it's small um they may be able to subdue it uh, by swallowing it whole, but generally what they'll do is they'll wrap themselves around, so I'm gonna get Crusher to do it for me. Imagine this is the head. They'll wrap themselves around like that. And they're basically going to squeeze. Now they've got incredibly powerful muscles that they use to suffocate their prey. Every time that prey item breathes out, they squeeze a little bit tighter. Um, now, these muscles are not just for killing, they're also for uh, locomotion, for moving. They've got symmetrical muscles, which basically mean that they can almost glide along the ground and they're constantly working, constantly moving to keep him going. Do we have any questions? Um, so we have 
one person. Carl saying Python and Red Tail Boa look the same, like like they've got similar markings. Do they have similar markings? Um, yeah, um, yeah, fairly similar. Um, yeah, you red. If, uh, do you have a Red Tail Boa then? Um, yeah, Red Tail Boas. I mean, they they yeah, they've got similar markings. To be fair, these markings are kind of perfect because they're quite. Um, applicable they're quite versatile to a few different surroundings um, as I said these guys are open grassland and forest um, so that that they are two very different habitats but these markings will work well if you're in a forest the last thing you want to be really particularly if you're a moderately large snake is bright green or um, sort of a very noticeable color these dark browns and blacks are really going to aid them down uh, at ground level um, because these guys are pretty much purely terrestrial they pretty much stay, spend their entire lives sitting on the ground so these markings do help them blend in uh, same with the yeah your red tail python although your red tail's more arboreal um and then joanne says how long is he is he still growing and how long could he grow to um three foot two foot two and a half three foot maybe uh, he's not a big snake um is he still growing yeah probably um quite slowly and in very very small amounts you won't get much bigger than this um, your royal pythons they can get up to sort of five six foot particularly if they're a female um, but generally anywhere between three to five feet is about average um, as I say he's only 12 years old so he's almost halfway through his life expectancy around 25 to 30 they tend to max out at um, although apparently in I think Oregon Zoo there was one that was meant to be 50 but I, I, not been able to find anything substantiating that um but yeah around 30 years so he might grow a little bit bigger maybe at most half a foot he's very unlikely to get much bigger than this any other questions fantastic so, far. so i'm going to ask you a question now and i'm hoping some of you can write in and give me the answer um i must admit i've done this in the past and it hasn't always worked uh, so i'll give you sort of five minutes if you can note the time so and then uh, i'll give you the answer uh, the answer, the question is, how do they manage to take a prey that's larger than their own head? How do they manage to swallow it whole? How do they manage to open their mouth that wide? Uh, and we'll come back to that question in just a bit. So, um, so yeah, thought to be fairly sight-based as well as scent-based hunters. Um, we often get asked, as Eric did, about them biting. It's actually the first question we usually get asked. Um, when we ask people to handle them, is is it going to bite me, and is it going to hurt if it bites me? Um, the answer is no, not really. Um, he's very unlikely to bite you. As I say, you'd be very lucky to be bitten because nobody's been done in 12 years. If you were to be bitten, um, it really wouldn't be painful at all. Um, these guys, corn snakes, their bites they're relatively insignificant. They're not particularly painful, and that's because they don't have large fangs. They don't. They have lots and lots of tiny, tiny little teeth. Um, and normally what they'll do is they'll bite and let go. If they bite and hold on, then yeah, that can be a bit uncomfortable, but generally they'll bite and let go. If you guys have ever been bitten by a gerbil or a hamster or a guinea pig, that's a hundred times more than a royal python or corn snake bite. Hamster bites are, without doubt, one of the worst bites I've ever experienced. Um, yeah, definitely in the top five. They, they're nasty things, uh, because they've got those two big, constantly growing, gnawing teeth. So you've got to think them sinking into your flesh. You've got two or three, you know, maybe a one and a half, two centimetres worth of tooth going in there. These guys, a millimetre, maybe slightly more. So yeah, not particularly powerful jaws. They don't need to have particularly big teeth or big fangs. They're constrictors, they're food to dead normally before they eat it. Um, but yeah, so um, they do need UV light. Um, so they, they will, they do benefit from it. Um, so they will come out and bask in the sun. They are ectothermic which means that they um, are cold basically they're cold blooded so we are obviously warm flat uh, warm blooded I believe we are endotherms is that the right way uh, endo ecto yeah and we're I'm gonna not say, 100% sure I think we're at an endotherms but basically yeah we're warm blooded which means that we regulate no, endotherm means you're taking it like all right then we're the other way yeah uh, whatever anyway we're basically we're warm blooded um we control our body temperature internally most of the time so when we get really hot we sweat when we get really cold we shiver um and they're just ways of regulating your own sort of homeostasis your own body temperature snakes um and sort of your reptiles can't do that really what they use is they use the external environment uh, to regulate their body temperature 
So what they will do, what uh, he will do is he'll come out a few hours, um, you know, uh, a little while before sunset, a little while after sunrise to bask and warm himself up. Warm himself up after the slightly cooler evening. And what they're going to be doing is they're going to use that heat to generate body heat and um, give them the energy to go out and hunt, um, uh, to, to lay eggs, to uh, find a mate. And they're going to use that, that warmth to get them to go about and do that. Now, just because they go to the temperature of their surroundings, just because they're reliant on the external environment um, to give them energy and to survive, it doesn't mean that um, they rapidly go. Snakes have got an amazing propensity to store that. Um, so less so with the royal pythons because they don't particularly need to there isn't a huge amount of temperature variation uh, but if you look at something like our adders you look at some of the cooler climate snakes um, they'll go out and they will they'll bask they'll absorb that heat and then they'll be able to um, survive off that for a long period of time same with this guy he's been sitting there basking underneath his heat lamp for well hours hours and hours and hours uh, warming himself up so while he's out here it means it's a gradual decline it's not instant um, so keep talking about keeping these guys in captivity um, snakes in general obviously an exotic pet they have seen a real uh, they've seen a real increase in popularity over the last few decades uh, and we're going to go on to that in a couple of minutes have we got any questions yeah we've got a we've got a few so we've got eric says where does his tail begin Good question, Eric. I like that question. Um, so I believe this is the right. This is the cloaca. This is the universal hole or universal port. I call it on a snake. This is where everything goes in of and out of. Just a sec. Everything below that is a tail. Um, everything above that is a body. So I'll try and show you that again. Cloaca. Everything below that is the tail. Do we have another question? Yes. Uh, why do people often, Carl says, why do people often think snakes are slimy? Um, I'm not <coughs> sure. Um, i give you my, yeah, I think it's a mixture of, um, a mixture of character characterization in the media and just the way they look. I'll admit they do, they do kind of give off this almost slimy vibe when you look at them. You can see that it, they almost look glazed, don't they? I don't know if you can catch that in the um, on the camera, but they do look that it's lovely shiny colour. And when we think of slime, when we think of that, that sort of texture, we usually think of something gross, something disgusting or horrible. And and snakes are characterised as being quite disgusting animals, quite horrible animals. Um, we are conditioned to believe that these. Uh, a lot of people are conditioned to believe that these animals are scary. Um, and that is absolutely nobody's fault. That is, uh, is an, it's thought to be an innate instinct. You're born with this predisposition to be slightly nervous uh, of things like snakes and spiders, animals that would in the past have caused us, uh, could potentially have been a predator, have been a threat to us in the past. Now, a lot of the time, these fears, these innate fears, they dissipate over over uh, the years. Um, because, I mean, most of us are born with a fear of birds and, uh, you know, the majority of us aren't scared of birds. Um, but there are certain things that are conditioned both by the media, by parents, um, just in society. Snakes, spiders, they're a really good example. Of that. They're an animal that has been con we've been conditioned to think are scary. Um, okay, do we have another question? Um, and then, Carl, it's kind of not a question, but it kind of goes on to an interesting point okay. of like of what it made me think of a question so carl said dislocated jaws to eat their food apparently it's painful for them too is this dislocated jaws is there much truth behind that right that is a fantastic answer carl um so they don't technically dislocate their jaw um it is a it's a myth that has been perpetuated for decades and it was something we genuinely believed up until very recently it was thought that they dislocated their jaw um, what um, they in fact have are hinge joints um, they have are you gonna let are you gonna let me show you this might look like I'm being a bit horrible to crush up but he's absolutely fine with me doing it there you are mate I don't know if you can see that there that there that little line basically that opens up like that allowing him to take things larger than his own head um, or slightly larger than the largest part of his body. I'm sorry, mate. Um, 
Um, they've also got hinge joints, they've got quite a malleable drawer, so basically it's movable, so the bottom drawer opens up like that, and then they can basically move it to take on larger prey. Um, but they don't technically dislocate their jaw. I'm glad that one came up, because yeah, that is one that, um, again, I, I thought anyway, um, uh, was how they did it, it's how I was taught they did it, um, and yeah, fairly recently we found out it's actually not how they do it. Um, have we got another question? Yeah, Mark Fernley says, can you describe the neck posture? Can I describe the neck posture? What, of the snake that's going yeah. to strike? Must be. Um, I can't make him do it. Um, it's kind of an S, almost like an S shape. Um, yeah, basically an S shape, it, it gives him that <laughs> extra spring, that extra sort of explosion of power to catch their prey depending on the prey depending on the snake though depends on the uh, speed of the uh, speed of the strike these guys are fairly rapid strikers but they pale in comparison to something like what I think is your favorite snake mark the eyelash pit viper um, which is um, above and beyond far quicker uh, than the royal python he also says can you describe its prehistoric spurs and what they used to be millions of years ago I can attempt to mark although uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong everybody from what I understand I'll show it to you here these here are the spurs um, and it is been it has been suggested that they are um, residual limbs so that, that is where the um, limbs the legs of the snake would have been um, I will say that that information for me anyway I read that a fairly long time ago so um, I could be wrong about that. Do make sure you double check it. But I believe that is um, residual limbs um, from your snake. Because they were, they had legs uh, in prehistoric times. I mean, uh, but I mean, uh, kind of an interesting point from that. These guys, they are fairly unchanged for millions and millions of years. There aren't many animals you can say that about. If you look at the evolution of a lot of our a lot of our mammals and a lot of our birds they've seen huge rapid anatomical change over the sort of millions of years even in the last 10,000 oh, years okay <laughs> we've gone limp yep okay camera malfunction Ugh. it did it does do this to me sometimes so you have to turn it off and back on again so hold it down sorry about this uh, there we go yeah, if you look at some of our mammals, our birds, you can see there's been huge change, even in the last 10,000 years. Um, not even, uh, and then looking further back, millions of years, there's been huge change in those animals. Something like a snake, um, and your reptiles in general, they are unchanged for millions and millions of years. And it shows you just what a fantastic design these guys are. A what swift. Got? Was that a swallow? Oh. Swift? Swallow? Are we gonna... I don't know. Okay, twitchers. Everybody on your cameras, what is that? I want to say swallow. The swallows are bigger, aren't they? Swallow. Is that what we're getting? I think, no, I think it's a swallow. Because swifts are like black. They can't land, can they, swifts? I think, yeah, no. Hang upside down, I'm very sure. I'm not prepared, I didn't do my research on swallows, I did it on snakes. Ah. Beautiful. Absolutely lovely. Anyway, sorry. Any I got other questions? Uh, Carl, Carl says, have you ever been bitten by a snake? Does it hurt? Uh, I have been bitten um, by a few snakes. Um, not particularly. Um, I got bitten by a snake with Mark, actually. Um, no, not particularly. Um, it really does depend on the snake. Um, if they hold on, then yeah, uh, it can be really it can be really uncomfortable because you've got to think those although they're very small teeth they're sitting in there um, and they are they are squeezing um, and it can be quite it can be quite uncomfortable and it can be quite a lot of pressure um, again you know a lot of your mammal bites hurt an awful lot more um, boa I think was it Carl who had mentioned about the red tail boa yeah I mean I'll say I used I've, I've got a uh, red tail boa um, and it's uh, I'll say that was one of the nastiest ones I had only because a tooth came out um, but yeah that sort of held on but, uh, I must admit boas generally have sort of a little almost like little man syndrome of the snake world um, or at least they're kind of known to have um, because obviously they're very small they're very vulnerable and they're going to get quite large so they are quite snappy 
um, like I say, it's always nice to be bitten and let go rather than that animal hold on. Any other questions? Yeah, Joanne says, does Crusher ever get live food? Live food? Uh, no. Um, so we all of his food is fed dead. Um, due to a, a UK and EU law, uh, no. What? It's not actually an official law because of special circumstances. Yeah, so due to a UK or EU law, um, and the vast majority of the time, um, if it's a vertebrate, so it's an animal with a backbone, it has to be fed dead. There are extenuating circumstances, there are special circumstances such as if a snake is refusing to feed, if the welfare of that animal is going to be infringed by not giving it life, I believe. Um, so no, we personally don't. We have no issues of our snakes feeding. Even him, he's a royal python, which are kind of notorious for being rubbish feeders. He's, he's pretty good. Um, so touch wood, we've never actually had to, we've never done a live feed. Um, I will say, setting aside the moral and ethical implications of a live feed, um, I won't get into that. Um, setting aside that, um, it is also uh, the sort of welfare of the animal you're feeding uh, your feed being your feeding the animal that's being fed um, the animal that's uh, actually eating that that the snake that's going to eat that live mouse or rat I don't know if any of you guys have ever been bitten by a mouse or a rat if you lock a mouse or a rat in a five foot enclosure with a snake chances are that snake is not going to come off very well um, as, as I said this guy's an ambush hunter his prey never sees him coming locked in an enclosure that animal's going to that mouse is going to do irreparable damage. That's a happy note. If you guys want to see some cool footage of snakes, go to Mark Fernley's Facebook page, uh, Untamed Photography um, and website. Um, they got some unbelievable pictures and videos on there, I believe. Yeah, Eric confirmed that it's a swallow. Thank you, Eric. He really is the, well, him and Joanne are the third and fourth members of our live stream team I must admit thank you guys for your continued support on these videos any other questions fantastic so um just a sec oh, oh well Carl said if the snakes eat live rat and the rat attacks back is it true snakes can die from this yes absolutely um yeah uh it can definitely it can do horrendous amount of damage to a snake um there is a reason it's such a last resort. Um, first of all, it's not nice for the mouse or the rat, obviously. Uh, but for the snake, as I say, a lot of them, they are built to be ambush hunters. Um, that, in a fair fight, they're, gonna ha um, they're not gonna win against a mouse or a rat. So yeah, they can do, they can have extreme damage. Now I am not being, um, um, I am not going to, I'm trying not to be rude. Um, but I am just going to check my phone to make sure we've had no messages that haven't come up on the Facebook feed because we've had that a few times. Uh, it'll be the live animal encounters. Here we go. Oh, you don't want to hear my voice. No, I think. No, I think we've had. Uh, yeah, I think we've read out all the questions. So, um, apologies to Mark, by the way, I've just checked my phone. Um, yes, uh, so thank you so much for watching. If you would like to share or video, uh, do the video sharing app thing, uh, you can be more, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, please um, like and comment and uh, react on the video. And if you have any other questions, any other comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I'm going to go and pop you back in your uh, enclosure. I think you're going to quite enjoy that. Um, and by the way, he gets fed on a Saturday. Um, so he's recently eaten. So uh, thank you very much, guys. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow at 11.30 with Mark and Katrina.